Okay, folks, how we doing? Maybe one more round of applause for Hugh, 22 years. Awesome, okay. Well, good morning. My name is Jeremy Eater. I'm a distinguished engineer and uh, chief AI ML strategist at Red Hat. Thanks for having me, my first time with you. Uh, today, I'm gonna go through couple things uh, that are on my mind, Red Hat's mind, uh, as we try and sort of democratize the field of AI. What I want to pitch to you today is three things. One is the major systemic challenges to democratizing AI and how the research community and academic community can do some real damage uh, against those problems in a good way. Uh, how Red Hat is currently thinking about these problems, or at least getting the ball rolling. Um, and one thing I should say is that a lot of this talk is gonna be mostly focused on generative AI, and that's not to say that traditional mean, uh, machine learning has no place. It has tremendous applicability, and I think my colleague Sanjay Arora will take you through some of the systems level use cases for that uh, just after I'm done here. So tremendous agenda. Uh, that I saw Oren go through a few minutes ago. I'd also like to take you through what the, uh, the AI Alliance is, which is an effort between Meta and IBM to gather industry together to make meaningful progress against some of these very, very thorny and sometimes expensive problems to solve. I'll finish up the talk proposing to you how this team can get, in, your t extended teams can get involved uh, today on some of these projects. Cool. All right, uh, so Gen AI. I've got a young daughter. Uh, she loves unicorns. Who doesn't? I love unicorns. I asked ChatGPT to draw me a picture of a unicorn. Pretty good. Majestic, even, I would say. Uh, oh, there's a clicker. Love it. Uh, so, but, but, this isn't the unicorn that she wanted. She wanted to color it, but have you ever seen a unicorn? What color is a unicorn? I don't know. Let's ask the machines. That's the reference implementation for what a unicorn looks like, I guess, right? Uh, some might argue that's a hallucination of the model. But here's, the, here's, here's what I'm trying to get at. Show me another technology, right, that can, with an access from your phone, or your computer, okay? Help with schoolwork in any language. Generate product ideas for any industry. Beyond text generation, we can also generate images. You probably already saw generating video from text a couple weeks ago from, uh, from OpenAI. Rapid prototyping of ideas. Couple that with 3D printing, and the, the engineering cycles are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Traditional software development. IBM has a thing. We have a widget uh, called Watson Code Assistant. You might have heard of GitHub Copilot, other similar implementations. The, the claims that traditional software development is on its way out, I believe, are over-exaggerated. Um, I believe for code generation, assistance is the only thing that will happen in the short term, especially for system software, where it requires nuance and detail and cost is a major factor. Um, not anytime soon, but largely can be assisted by the technology that exists today. If anyone has another technology that, that has this level of uh, potential, we should be looking into that too, but this is where we're at like now. It's, it's a major, major step change in productivity for the human race. Personally, I think we should apply it towards, uh, as much as possible towards good, AI for good. Um, the fact that we can do disease research and healthcare research and safety research and trust research in such tighter loops is going to help move the needle well beyond the IT and software development and AI technology practitioners to folks like my daughter. They just want to color a unicorn. 
You may have heard Jensen say this on his recent uh, earnings call about in the last week. Uh, he might have some motives for it, but uh, you know he's, he's pretty close, I think. I just tried to argue the case for him. Um, you know, this field will, we're just sort of walking through the door. And I like the analogy Hugh just said. He's like, this, just pushing an open door is kind of what's happening now. And we are gonna walk through this door into Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, ideally, where the promise is limitless. A limitless promise using this technology. How do we, as human beings, reorient our thinking around these new capabilities? It's hugely important. Before, I used to go to the dollar store and try and page through, or Amazon, and try and page through coloring books to find a unicorn. Now, I just ask the machine for it and print it out, if I can get the printer to work. So what I'd like to propose here is that while it may be opening doors for a new industry, we, we won't maximize the impact until we as the leaders, you as the leaders in this industry, reorient your thinking to harness these truly revolutionary generative AI capabilities. Red Hat's a for-profit company, subsidiary of IBM, for-profit company. So we do intend, I just want, I don't want to bury the lead here, we do intend to productize some of this stuff eventually. Um, you have OpenShift AI, as I understand, 400 students using it daily. Absolutely love that sort of thing. And I hope, it's I hope you're successful using it and providing us feedback where there's sharp edges or we could do better. Absolutely love that, have to capture it. Red Hat strategy isn't going to change for Gen AI necessarily. We're pushing an open source significantly. Um, we're sponsoring, you know, Kubeflow is a major component of OpenShift AI, and we're sponsoring Kubeflow Summit. We just got somebody elected to the steering committee. We've got dozens of committers over there, um, and uh, that's just one component of the whole stack. So we're going in and doing, that is kind of like the table stakes product level stuff. There's also forward looking stuff that we're getting involved with, and VLLM is one of those things that we're looking into. Uh, OpenAI, Triton, and Vulkan for GPU abstraction to kind of insulate developers from, uh, we hope, the diverse hardware ecosystem that blossoms over the next year or two. Okay, so you don't have to necessarily change your app every minute, depending on what GPU you land on. Let me get into some of the uh, challenges that, that we see. Currently, there's haves and have-nots. The haves are generally hyperscalers, folks that, can folks that can afford massive compute to use this technology, um, and, that can and that have access to the educational resources that it takes to begin leveraging those components. Two weeks ago, I, I had the opportunity and, and privilege to brief some of the North Carolina Congress people on their thinking for legislating AI. Uh, in the sort of, just after the executive order, you may have seen drop uh, a couple months back. And one of the folks that I met there was a Duke University professor, and his job was to push education down into high schools. He may have wanted to be more aggressive than that, but that was his first step. So that's one person who's taken among themselves to continue to push education in the way that they can in academia. You folks are doing the same. So I feel like this challenge is right up your alley. And we need everybody to understand that to open the door to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, we need the talent and the passion of young folks to drive this industry forward. I started to think, what is keeping people on the sidelines from participating in generative AI adoption. Quite honestly, what it comes down to a lot of is like, there's ambiguity right now. It's a gold rush time. Licensing is ambiguous. What are the permissions in, uh, on the data? Was it sourced uh, permissively? You know, and when you, pr when you release a model into production, can you trust its output? Is it going to return the name of your competitor? <laughs> Maybe not ideal. 
Um, and most importantly, we don't let you know, hate, abuse, profanity escape into these models. These are things that Red Hatters are currently uh, looking into industry-wide. Um, this is a major point, a, I would call it a gap and a challenge. This is an area where I was mentioning Kubeflow as an upstream component of OpenShift AI. Um, Red Hat uh, Engineering has developed uh, a widget called Trusty AI, which is an open source project that attempts to implement some of these guardrails. Y'all are welcome to participate in that development, by the way. Open source, Trusty AI on GitHub. It, is, it does remain, that's not a solved problem, not by any stretch. Um, it needs work, and these are areas where uh, I feel like the whole industry will benefit if we get more and more people off the sidelines by, f by solving these, these foundational kind of uh, first principles problems. Developer participation. So we talked, I just talked about kind of the, the broader industry adoption. Let's talk about you folks and your extended teams. You know, if you ever watch uh, a model developer their, their experience is, let's just say, suboptimal. <laughs> um, and you know, compared to cloud-native development, uh, DevOps, things that have had 10 plus years to bake, you know, we're just opening the door towards improving and uh, democratizing that experience and making, you know, removing some of the sharp edges. There's a ton of room, and I just, I'm just thinking about tooling here, like developer tooling, but there could be hardening that gets done in production around tools, and right now, Access to those tools is tied up with the, I mentioned the haves and the have nots earlier. Access to some of the world leading tools are tied up in closed source. You can pay for it, and you can have it right now. With that comes some costs, with that comes some lock in, um, and you know, your ability to contribute is zero. So this is a major problem or major challenge for you folks to participate in as well. Uh, so I hope there's some of my colleagues from other hardware vendors here. I think maybe Intel, AMD folks might be in the room. Um, <laughs> I don't think I don't think anyone is going to be successful, or, or you know, should be thinking that we're successful if there's one hardware vendor at the heart of this entire new industry. That simply won't work. We saw what that did with Intel. Um, they had a massive lead, and then there was sort of over time some competition came in. Uh, we we need to encourage that, and I understand that the MOC is working with those vendors and maybe others to potentially provide those types of hardwares to develop that type of hardware and software stacks to developers. That's tremendous. That's tremendous. If nothing else, access to this hardware right now is tough. It's tough. These cards are ten grand a piece sometimes. Right? List price, of course. Um, that's a lot of money for a kid learning to tie up for any period of time. So there's cost pressure. There's access, like can you even buy them kind of a thing. And whether or not we agree that one vendor is the solution for this space and fully democratizing it, I think that's what's up for debate. So, competition in this space is huge for users. Red Hat being kind of like a Switzerland company, uh, we've been working with AMD and Intel and NVIDIA and others to make sure that OpenShift AI provides equal access to that hardware regardless of the vendor. We want a first class experience through OpenShift AI, plumbing the best of those hardware vendors' capabilities up to you. Now, this is my favorite one. Uh, you may have seen an announcement just last week or the week before from the Allen Institute. They released a model finally with all of the data, weights, by, uh, uh, training data, and the model itself under a permissive license. So that's the first. That's a good thing. We need more of that. And we're not going to get it from the folks who have already tied up the value, who are lobbying our uh, government to essentially create a firewall for themselves and basically establish themselves as a monopoly. That's not going to work. Um, our industry needs to get towards 
open models as a standard through which everyone can contribute. This is important work that needs doing, a significant challenge, and needs the brightest minds in academia to make a dent. Last one. I mentioned talking to the couple of Congress people a couple weeks back. I don't know if you folks are uh, involved in talking with those folks, but they need help. And I, I will give you my personal point of view here. I don't believe that legislating the technology is the right move. I believe legislating the application of the technology is the right move. For example, you wouldn't put an LLM to the flight control systems of an, air, of an airplane, at least not for a long time, right? But drawing coloring books for unicorns, fair game. So when we talk with our legislators, and IBM has been at uh, the World Economic Forum along with many other leaders and uh, in Davos, and I think we're doing a, an event today with Axios, uh, which is bringing together a lot of politicians uh, to try and prove the point that the technology itself is no really more, you know, quote unquote, dangerous than other innovations in the past. Significant challenge, a lot of ambiguity. Um, I'm forgetting the acronym, but there was a national, uh, was it NIST? There was a national group that put out a list of like 50 questions that the president and his team wanted answered around AI. Uh, these are the types of, this is where we're at when it comes to legislation. Like the policy frameworks in the EU are far more um, understood in, in, uh, in the, you know, North America, South America, far less legislation for us to lean on at the moment. And the idea here is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, to make sure that we don't stifle innovation uh, due to basically a lack of understanding. So if you folks have the opportunity to talk with legislators, that's, the, um, that's sort of the, the mindset we want them to be in, is that the technology itself is broadly applicable and can be made safe while also not stifling um, innovation. Okay, so let me just try and round these things out. The AI Alliance is that, a way to uh, harness open innovation. We have about 85 members now, including the MOC, uh, and including Meta and IBM and many others. The idea for the AI Alliance is to bear down on the six challenges that I just shared with you across industry, and try and make meaningful progress urgently across all six of those domains. Some of them are more relevant, I think, to the MOC, um, but uh, that's, that's the problem space, at least the initial problem space that the AI Alliance is working with. So I put, I put this little you are here icon because the key piece here is that we are bridging, the AI Alliance is bridging uh, academia, and industry and bring us all together in the same forum to tackle these really thorny shared problems. If you wanted to participate, what would you do? First, there has to be a strategy in place for how you engage. Uh, the AI Alliance holds meetings regularly across all of these work streams. They're, they're, this is announced in December and just kind of getting ratcheted up towards the end of January. These various work streams are still getting cranking. I think most, if not all of them, have already met at least once or twice. Um, I mentioned Trusty AI, and you, you may be familiar with Open Data Hub, which is our sort of, it's our free version of OpenShift AI, uh, free and open source. That's deployed here on the MOC, and I believe is, in, is involved in many, many of the projects that uh, Oran was talking about. Those projects can be innovated on either in the open source community or you can work in the AI Alliance to do that. Um, there's plenty more projects that are being donated. Um, these 85 plus industry participants are uh, each coming forward with new and interesting ideas that they think make a dent against one of those challenges. Um, and so it's a tremendous kind of groundswell of enthusiasm just by creating sort of a lightning rod for uh, cross org and cross sort of industry and academia, uh, bringing all of those folks together, a tremendous opportunity. So not only do they have existing participation and existing, sorry, existing projects, 
anyone can bring a new project or a new idea. If you're willing to build it, willing to work with people, this can be a place where you bring uh, your, your bright ideas, your innovation, and share it with the world. Tremendous microphone. But lastly, the larger community um, of the AI Alliance also needs help, just like the MOC Alliance needs help to grow, um, and Iran and Hugh have done a tremendous job over the last many years doing that. The AI Alliance can also use that same sort of enthusiasm. This slide is supposed to be hidden, and it's not. <laughs> so um, so the, what are some of the specific things that the, uh, the MOC Alliance members can do? Right here, these two things uh, talk about uh, how we rapidly evolve the tooling space. So I think that was challenge number, number three. Um, I understand, as I mentioned, that there's many other GPU vendors that are going to come into the facility. I love speeds and feeds, by the way. I was in performance engineering at Red Hat for seven years. Um, so that was, uh, and I did wall, like high frequency trading, performance tuning, and stuff like that. Um, so I love the speeds and feeds. I don't necessarily like storage because it's like it's too slow, but the <laughs> speeds and feeds of the MOC are impressive, and you have done a tremendous job in getting all that gear together for this innovation. I believe that you can harness the power of the MOC to help us more rapidly turn around and rapidly innovate on those, at least half of those challenges. I think one, three, and four, diverse hardware being the fourth one, uh, it's, just, it's just right up your alley. It really feels like it. And then the last bit is the, uh, the, the students that are getting access to this gear and just the, the skills gap that I mentioned earlier. And how do we inform what those people need and what tools need to be developed to expand, the, uh, to expand adoption, right? All of that can be done on the gear that you've got right now. There is literally nothing stopping you from doing this. Uh, you can do it from your laptop right now. I love the potential of the MOC Alliance and AI Alliance together. This is my proposal to you. Feels like the right moves. Um, leaving it to all of you to figure out what the right next moves are. But to me, this seems really obvious where the Venn diagrams are kind of almost entirely uh, overlapping. And the fact that there's going to be like a Dataverse instance over here, and you so you don't have to like worry about access to data to kind of you, uh, demonstrate you know your proof of concept and innovation is going to be huge. Absolutely huge. Um, there's a Chris talk coming later today, uh, AI applied to medical. I personally mentioned that I, I mentioned that I love the AI for good angle. Yeah, there's a story that uh, I'll just leave you with one anecdote here. Rural hospitals, very underfunded. There's a technology that can, tra uh, can, can turn a 2D ultrasound, which most of these rural, rural hospitals have, uh, into a 3D ultrasound using machine learning for graphics. Huge benefit for those mothers who now have access to better uh, technology or better uh, uh, um, imaging technology than they would have otherwise had, and those hospitals don't have to outlay huge amounts of cash for those additional, uh, additional equipment. That's the type of stuff, it's like, it seems so simple, right? But it, it, it improves the lives of so many people through those efforts. It's just tremendously inspiring. Those types of innovations, I just, I get teary-eyed because I love to see humans helping humans. Okay, so. Last thing before I tie off, um, this is roughly how we innovate. So I mentioned all of those different communities. I mentioned uh, Kubeflow uh, and Trust AI. There's so many more. KServe is a really interesting one where VLLM support, I believe, got added to KServe two weeks ago um, for inference serving. PyTorch, massive investment in PyTorch from IBM. Hundreds of people working on PyTorch right now. Um, so that innovation if you work in the upstream or work in academia, whatever, it eventually bubbles into OpenShift AI on your systems in this, uh, sorry, Open Data Hub in this flow, and then ultimately into our product. That's how that works, in case you didn't know. I wanted to say thank you here. One last thing. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to our hosts here at Boston University. My first time here, apparently, um, Lots of stuff going on with OpenShift AI and Red Hat and AMOC and Boston University. Absolutely love the facility. Thank you so much for having uh, this conference here, and thank you so much for having me. <laughs>